Space is hostile. The vast expanses of interstellar space provide some of the darkest, but also coldest places possible in the universe. Any conception of loneliness we have on this planet, whether it be wintering over in an Antarctic ice station, sitting on a submarine passing through Point Nemo, or orbiting high above in the International Space Station, pales in comparison to the utter loneliness of the expanses of deep interstellar space. Even entire star systems you might encounter could be devoid of any others, perhaps most of them are, and might provide only scant raw materials and a rare glance at a sun. As a result, right now we envision crossing interstellar space in two main ways. The first is robotically. Robots, at least if they aren't artificial generalized intelligences, do not get lonely. Though maybe AGI does, we shall see. But regular robots simply function and follow through with their task until they stop functioning or complete their mission. On our level, this includes both mechanical failure, abandonment, but also nuclear decay, as the plutonium pellets we must use to power our outer solar system probes heading into deep space decay too far to continue to provide meaningful power. Any probe above and beyond this will need a better power system, perhaps hydrogen fusion using Bassard collectors or some other means of long distance propulsion. The other idea is traveling the distances ourselves in what would presumably be multi-generational ships. This is usually envisioned Battlestar Galactica style, either with some gigantic ship or self-sufficient city embedded in a hollowed out asteroid or O'Neill cylinder, where people are born, live life, and never leave their self-sufficient traveling island until it gets to the intended destination, which could take thousands of years. And throughout, there's always the risk of something failing, so catastrophically that the whole thing collapses. These are themes often found in science fiction. In the original movie Alien, an implied very old but defunct starship is found complete with its dead and mummified pilot. Here the culprit was coming up against an aggressive alien organism. But it could just as easily be a failure of a critical system or chain of systems that might cause an interstellar starship failure. Another example would be Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Brahma, where a ship is not defunct but somewhat dormant, awaiting its true destination. You might say that interstellar travel is just too difficult for biologicals. It's simply far better to stay at home and leave it to the mindless robots. But you could also envision a hybrid scenario, where the utility of biology and the utility of technology are merged. In short, you send out a robotic probe to navigate the vast ocean of interstellar space, only to print out hybridized, customized technological biological beings to populate whatever exoplanet you've chosen to set up shop at. Any of these scenarios are plausible, but they often grandly envision far future technologies that we have only just begun to envision and flush out that might not work out in practice. An example of this is suspended animation. This trope is everywhere in sci-fi from stasis to freezing and carbonite. It provides a convenient way to get humans from point A to point B, while avoiding the trials and tribulations of conscious, deep space travel at sublight speeds, and the crushing but resource expensive boredom that would come with it. Barring this, there's always faster than light speeds, but as we've developed technologically, these tropes have aged. As far as we can tell, faster than light travel is a unicorn that the universe just doesn't allow you to do. Or if it does, it requires massive quantities of energy, such as in an Alcubierre warp drive. Suspended animation has proven problematic. If you want to freeze someone, you not only have to essentially fill them with antifreeze to mitigate cellular damage, you must also mitigate things like one's own body's natural radioactivity, accumulating a fatal dose. The way past this is the invocation of far future nanotechnology that can repair cells and especially DNA from the base upward, on an atomic scale. The reality here is that while it is within the realm of plausibility, it's only just so. Nanotechnology on that level is almost certain to take its time in repairing an organism that's been in deep freeze. You can only generate so much heat before you vaporize your rather complicated patient. It may actually take centuries to wake someone up. 
and that still assumes that memory in humans isn't some kind of standing wave, that when it's gone, it's gone. Rather, it's something that can be recovered. We don't really know the answer to that yet. But what we can do with interstellar travel is take a look at what we as humans do. How have we managed to ensure our own survival on this world, which can be quite hostile in its own right? And how do we apply that to space? One thing we are sure to do is plan for it, and this is something we appear to have always done. In a recent video I mentioned the idea of tally-like marks in 25,000 year old cave paintings as being instructional on how to survive the local environment, what and when to hunt, and done in such a way that even people from far away might be able to interpret the marks. This actually could have been far more prevalent at the time than we know. We have the bias that we have protected caves that sheltered not only our human ancestors but also their paintings. What we don't really know are things like what do they carve into trees? After all, humans love signposts. We generally put them up everywhere from crosswalks to stop signs, and we even make some attempt to make those things universal enough that almost anyone living on planet Earth can understand them, no matter where they are from. It's possible we've always done this, with instructions preserved on rocks and trees that have long since disappeared. Or you could do it via oral or song traditions, such as with the aboriginal peoples in Australia, where maps were encoded in songs passed painstakingly down generation after generation. Point is, the idea of calling each other on the phone and communicating or sending emails is not new, just the form of communication has changed. As far as messaging, humans have done this apparently since time immemorial. We live in a world of messages, but we also go further. In hiking, ill-used cabins can be found in remote places where hikers leave spare supplies for anyone else that might find that cabin and stay the night. This extends to the human exploration of space. The International Space Station, for example, sports a medical kit, and is normally kept stocked for as many months as possible. As we expand out into the solar system, we may well leave defunct stations and spacecraft stocked just in case someone gets into trouble out there. The interesting thing about this behavior is that it may actually be something alien civilizations recognize and do, perhaps on a far greater scale than a single star system. And they may also do it on a much bigger, much more capable scale than we can currently imagine. The first concept here is a SETI emergency beacon. We often see SETI signals as intentional communications between civilizations saying hello to each other, or merely detecting each other's radar but it could just as easily be messages of utility. One example here would be a signpost, perhaps saying to any passing travelers that a certain element, such as phosphorus, which may be rare in the galaxy but still eminently useful, can be found in abundance in this particular star system. Or you can flip that around. Don't come to this star system because we've already been here and picked it over. They may even do this by means of transmitting or otherwise depicting the structure of atoms in hopes of being understood. We did this with one of the plates we affixed to our Pioneer spacecraft, the depiction of a hydrogen atom, though there to show the hyperfine transition, because otherwise, while hydrogen is useful, it's also the most common element in the universe and is everywhere in the galaxy. But there are elements that may be of use that are a lot rarer than that. And that brings us to an enigma of a star that I've made videos on before but warrants another look due to a few recent developments. It's known as HD 101065 or Zhabilsky's star, and it has a chemical profile unlike any other star we've ever seen. Peculiar isn't a strong enough word here. Located about 356 light years away, it shows two really strange things. The first is that it has underabundances of some metals that it really should have more of, including iron and nickel. These elements are everywhere, thanks to supernovae, and entire metallic meteorites fall frequently on Earth, made up of a mix of these two materials, often along with carbon, interestingly enough. But in the end, this underabundance is unusual, but not Earth-shaking. Metal-poor stars exist, and the ranges are all over. But the problem is that HD 101065 isn't metal-poor in the sense that we usually see that. Rather, it's poor in common metals, what it does show are high abundances of metals like cesium, neodymium, thorium, ytterbium, holmium, strontium, uranium, 
yttrium, scandium, niobium, and so on. Not metals of enormous commonality, but they do occur in nature, so it's a head scratcher. Not a norm for a star, but not show stopping magic. Rather, that some odd circumstance is going on with a star. But it doesn't stop there. A number of years ago, researchers looked more deeply into the spectrum of this star and found something very odd indeed. Now, I have to caveat this. It's never been clear just how reliable these measurements were, and they have never been confirmed. But they are still widely cited. They detected elements that should not exist in any real abundance in nature outside of a laboratory. Yet, there they were. These included the scary ones, the transuranic elements. This includes berkelium, plutonium, actinium, neptunium, protactinium, americium, californium, and einsteinium, which the longest isotope has a life of 472 days. If the detections are correct, and that's actually a big if, because this is one complicated star and misinterpretation is very possible here, especially when dealing with elements we only normally ever see in a lab. But if so, the star becomes a candidate technosignature. In fact, pending confirmation, it would be the strongest candidate technosignature we've ever seen, above and beyond even the WOW signal. On a more solid footing in the detection were other radioactive elements, such as technetium and promethium, which are very hard to envision having in a star unless it has really heavy transuranic elements decaying. Promethium's longest-lived isotope is just over 17 years. So whatever is going on with the star, it's rapidly replenishing those elements. If this all can be confirmed, we're either going to have to take a serious look at it as a technosignature, but also if there is some weird nuclear process that allows nature to occasionally do this that we aren't aware of. Either way, it's strange and new. There's always been a hypothesis that transuranic elements eventually hit an island of stability far up the periodic table. How this would be reached is unclear. You'd need something like a neutron star bombarding it. But no such thing appears to be present. But more recent work suggests that it might simply be hidden from view from our perspective. But there's an issue. It should be producing large amounts of deuterium. And it's not. From a SETI point of view, the idea has been that if you want to send out a message to the galaxy, salt your star with elements that do not appear in nature. This idea was originally applied to plutonium by Sagan and Shlovsky, and that is present in this star. But, hello, we're here may not be the actual message. Rather, it may be saying that if you need these rare elements, and you're in the neighborhood of this star, they are available. On the other hand, it can also be interpreted as aliens dumping nuclear waste into their star. Back to the idea of survival rations, however. This is unlikely. You would not leave food for an alien, because the chances of biological compatibility on that level are extremely low. We can't even digest the most common carbohydrate on Earth, wood, much less digest whatever an alien might be eating. But what you can do is create something that can universally make whatever you need, should you encounter one in a star system with sufficient resources. We could call it the von Neumann survival machine, and it would be a 3D printer essentially that could be stationed in a star system, that can be used to print out whatever any passing species might need, from nutrients to proteins. Learning to operate alien technology you might run across actually could be easier than decoding a radio signal since you have on-site examination abilities. It might be marked with a radio beacon that you only see at sufficient distance to make use of it. But you don't need to see such a thing halfway across the galaxy. That would require too much energy for something unlikely to be useful. It could even go so far as to be able to copy and print out or alter your genetic code, or make copies of itself and populate the entire galaxy with such oasis probes. In this hypothetical model, not yet well explored in sci-fi, there is somewhat of a sore thumb, however. If a radio beacon is how these objects might be located by travelers, then we have not seen evidence of this in our own star system. There could be any number of reasons why, but it may be so simple that inhabited star systems are not used for their raw materials in deference to those already living there. Or there's simply nothing interesting enough in the star system to even bother leaving a beacon. 
Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently worried about low temperature life leaving replicators of this nature. You go in hoping for a hamburger after a long journey living on algae rations, and the best it can do is a negative 179 Celsius hydrocarbon soup with nourishing iron chips that takes four centuries to print. Well, they meant well. Anyway, be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular, in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.